Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you're having a fantastic Friday. Welcome back to The Philip DeFranco Show. And if you're new here on Fridays, we do things a little bit different. Specifically, I try to cover more stories that we were trying to get to this week, didn't get to with the previous shows, as well as cover more viewer-requested stories. But with that said, let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna start off light. We're gonna talk about the viewer-requested story where people wanted me to talk about Jake Paul being sued again. But I looked into it, and two things. The first being, this story was actually not new. This was in local news last month. And two, it's it's not technically Jake Paul that's being sued. It's actually his talent manager, Krista Burden. And she is reportedly being sued by an Aspen woman by the name of Isabel Friedheim. And reportedly, she is suing on allegations that Burden and others used the residence for video production while trashing the home and driving vehicles through the property's tennis court and neighbor's lawns. The reports then point to Jake Paul's own videos from that time where you see him in the house. <laughs> lawsuit also goes on to claim the disorderly conduct allowed and encouraged by Burdett included driving vehicles at excessive speeds and in an irresponsible fashion on the property and throughout the neighborhood, driving vehicles on the property's lawn, neighbor's lawns, and on protected open fields throughout the neighborhood, driving off-road vehicles on the property's tennis court, pulling individuals on sleds throughout the neighborhood, driving off-road vehicles on the property and throughout the residential neighborhood at night, and using microphones and sound systems in the property at excessive noise levels. And in fact, on top of all of that, Friedheim claims there was such a negative reaction to Team 10 and everything they were doing here, that the Homeowners Association demanded that she forfeit the rent she got for the two months they were there. And yeah, that's the story. I don't, I don't know really what else I can add. Oh, actually, you know what? I, I know what I'll add here. Earlier this week, I mentioned that massive creator KSI is coming out with his own documentary. Following that, some people said, well, why didn't you talk about Logan Paul's documentary that he said is coming out? And I will say that's because I, I, I want to see what it ends up being more and more about before I, I express my complete disgust. Logan Paul, who of course had that disgusting suicide forest scandal, and then he went on that whole apology tour, blah, 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 blah. And on a recent vlog, he said this. But we're actually filming a documentary about everything that's happened this year, all the stuff that went down in January, where I was at in my life and kind of the psyche of what actually happened, which includes my upbringing. So I, I visited the high school wrestling team, gave a little speech to the kids. And as cynical as I am, I always try to, to hope for the best in people. And I'm hoping that this, this is in some way a, a selfless move. But I can't help deep down feeling like this is a potentially a PR play where he is monitoring monetizing off of his suicide scandal. But I'm gonna hold off on that, wait to see if there's more information, like all of the profits from it are going towards a suicide awareness charity. But I don't know, it feels like more and more where I'm hoping to see the good in people, I end up just feeling like an asshole afterwards. But actually a question I do wanna pass off to you there, what are your thoughts about a documentary about that whole time and situation? Disgusting PR move or no, this could actually be a positive? And then let's talk about a story around Felix Finkbeiner. And the story we're talking about today actually starts with Felix back in 2007. He's nine years old, he starts a children children's initiative called Plant for the Planet. And the idea, as they explain on the website, is that children could plant one million trees in every country on Earth and thereby offset CO2 emissions all on their own while adults are still talking about doing it. And the movement gains some steam and it starts building and more and more kids become involved. And in just three years, the organization plants its one millionth tree in Germany. And it continues to grow and grow both the movement and the actual trees. And as of this week, reportedly 100,000 children have joined the organization. According to their reports, they have planted over 15 billion trees, and the now 20-year-old Felix is expanding on this project and has launched the One Trillion Tree Campaign. And the thing is, when you actually look into the numbers and the goals and the needs, the, the numbers aren't insane. It's believed around three trillion trees exist globally. And the fact that this organization has planted 15 billion trees is amazing. But a study conducted back in 2015 found that humans cut down that same number of trees every year. 15 billion trees every year. And so I just want to make sure that I included this story on this Friday show because I, I know that there's there's a lot of negative in the world. And I think it's important we shine a spotlight on the, the people and organizations trying to do good in the world. Especially when there's a story that, that really showcases that, uh, that a lot of the good in the world can come from the youth. I mean, just think about that. He started it when he was nine. I'm both impressed and now feel like a lazy piece of shit. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today. And today in Awesome, brought to you by betterhelp.com slash DeFranco. And BetterHelp, if you don't know, is the fantastic service where you can get affordable private online counseling. You get access to licensed, trained, experienced, 
experienced accredited psychologists, marriage and family therapists, clinical social workers, and board licensed professional counselors. All you've got to do is go to betterhelp.com slash DeFranco. You fill out the questionnaire, they match you with a counselor, and you can start counseling today right on your computer or via your phone thanks to an app. You can do it via text, audio, or video. The main point, if that sounds interesting to you, you've been kind of thinking about trying something like this out, check it out and go to betterhelp.com slash DeFranco. And the first bit of awesome today is if you were looking for another bonus news video from us, uh, you actually get one. We did a story on Canada as part of a new series we're testing that you guys are involved in. I, I really enjoyed it. So if you want to watch, do it, uh, it up. If you want to watch it, link down below. I'm leaving it in there. It's Friday. Then Casually Explained gave us fantastic information on how to read the stock market. Then we've got the fantastic news that Idris Elba is joining one of my favorite guilty pleasure franchises. And that is the Fast and Furious franchise, specifically a spinoff with Dwayne Johnson. According to the reports coming out, he's going to play the villain. Then ASAP Science gave us a video on audio illusions. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then, unfortunately, we have a horrible update around the, the young Thai boys and their coach that are stuck in a cave that we covered earlier this week. If you're not familiar with this story, I'll, I'll link to our coverage down below. But unfortunately, the rescue efforts for the soccer team have run into complications. One, reportedly, there's too many people in the cave, and so oxygen levels are running low. And so what they're trying to do is run a tube through the cave to give them oxygen. Unfortunately, it's difficult to fit. The conditions have been horrible, and they're extremely far away, reportedly three kilometers inside of the cave. And reportedly, oxygen levels have fallen from 21% to 15%. And that's incredibly significant because at around 15% O2, you're talking about faulty judgment, exhaustion with minimal exercise. And so the plan right now is to have everyone dive out of the cave, which unfortunately brings us to this newish tragedy. One diver, specifically 38-year-old Petty Officer Saman Gunan, a former Thai Navy SEAL, he's retired but returned to aid in the rescue operation, died on Friday while returning from a trip to deliver oxygen to the boys in the cave. Reportedly, he ran out of oxygen himself. He lost consciousness. His partner tried to revive him, but he just, he didn't make it. And after this, his body was returned home where his casket was draped with a Thai flag and attended by 100 officials. They also reportedly held 10 minute moments of silence in his honor. And obviously when you look at this story, you, you see that he died a hero, but it doesn't make it any less horrible. And what it also does is it really highlights how hard this cave dive is. Reportedly, some parts of the cave are so narrow that scuba tanks have to be taken off and pushed in front of the divers. Unfortunately, it's difficult to fit. The conditions have been horrible and they're extremely far away, reportedly over three kilometers inside of the cave. Additionally, when I mentioned that the dive is three kilometers, that's just two chamber three. And then there's a 1.5 kilometer trek from chamber three to the cave's entrance. And altogether, you're talking about a six hour dive. And so as far as what happens from here, according to a news conference today, reportedly the boys have learned to dive. But with that said, they said that there won't be a rescue attempt tonight at the time of the news conference. It was 9 p.m. there. Although at the time of the news conference, they said they would not be attempting the rescue right then, adding that when they attempt this rescue, they want to do it when the risk is minimal. So that's where we are right now, and hopefully we get better news soon. We also got an update to the Justin Trudeau groping allegation story, a situation reportedly involving an anonymous female reporter at a music festival 18 years ago. All those years ago, an article was released that said that Justin Trudeau had groped this woman, that article also including an alleged apology from Trudeau. The last time we covered this story, Trudeau had just given this statement. I had a, a good day that day. I don't remember any uh, negative interactions that day at all. Following that, though, many were confused as to why he would have given this apology then if everything was fine. And as of yesterday, Justin Trudeau has given a longer statement. I've been reflecting very carefully on what I remember from that incident almost 20 years ago. And again, I am, I feel, I am confident that I uh, did not act inappropriately. But part of this awakening that we're having as a society, a long awaited uh, realization, is that it's not just uh, one side of the story that matters that the same interactions could be experienced very differently from one person to the next. And I am not going to speak for the, the woman in question. I would never presume to speak for her. Again, I've been uh, reflecting on the actual interaction and uh, if I uh, apologized later, then it would be because I sensed that she was not entirely comfortable with the interaction we had. But I respect uh, the fact that someone else might have experienced that differently. And this is part of the reflections that we have to go through. And several times in that statement, he hits on the note of, you know, we can have different perceptions of an interaction. And so with this story, I do want to pass that question off to you. What do you think about that specific response? Also, if you agree with that response and idea, do you think it also excuses what may have transpired? And also, do you feel that Justin Trudeau is being treated differently than other men who have had allegations placed against them? Then we got the massive news yesterday that Scott Pruitt, the head of the EPA had resigned.
resigned. President Trump tweeting, I've accepted the resignation of Scott Pruitt as the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. Within the agency, Scott has done an outstanding job and I will always be thankful to him for this. The Senate confirmed deputy at EPA, Andrew Wheeler, will on Monday assume duties as the acting administrator of the EPA. Now, as far as why Pruitt resigned, according to him and his resignation, he cites that the unrelenting attacks on me personally, my family are unprecedented and have taken a sizable toll on all of us. If you're not familiar with Scott Pruitt, we, we've talked about him a, a few times in the past. He has just kind of been plagued with scandals. There were stories about how he had two sets of scheduling books. His administrator would delete controversial meetings he had and then put it on a separate internal only one. You had the Washington Post reporting that Pruitt was pressuring aides to find his wife a job with a salary of at least $200,000. Reports that he had aides book hotels on their own personal cards and then he wouldn't reimburse them. And that's in addition to several other scandals that we've talked about before. Some we haven't even included. Other investigations. And it was also interesting to see the reaction after the resignation was announced. Republican Carlos Corbello tweeting, Finally. Actually, he did a horrible job. He was a disaster and an embarrassment from day one and the country is far better off without him. Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer tweeting, Took you long enough? Still a very long way to go to fully drain the swamp. Senator Bernie Sanders tweeting, Scott Pruitt was the worst EPA administrator in the history of the agency. And then finally, one of the standout responses came from Walter Schaub, former director of the U.S. Office Government of Ethics, who tweeted, Good riddance to a locust named Scott Pruitt. Sadly, for those of you in Congress who enabled his rampage by abdicating your duty, this departure closes the door on your opportunity for redemption. You've set a new bar for government ethics and we'd need shovels to fall below it. Fuck, Walter, how do you really feel? Oh, and actually he added to it, writing in this age when POTUS refers to humans as animals, I hasten to add that locust is a metaphorical allusion to the plague of locusts and refers to the havoc Pruitt wreaks. Pruitt is human and I hope he gets help with that drive to plunder public resources. Or an invoice. But where I'll end this, for those cheering that Scott Pruitt is now out, if you're cheering because you're glad Scott Pruitt's out, there were too many controversies that you thought he was abusing the position, sure. But if you're cheering because you think now things are going to change at the EPA, uh, yeah, you shouldn't. His replacement as head of the EPA is Andrew Wheeler, who is a former coal lobbyist. It's not crazy to think that you would still essentially have Pruitt's agenda just without all the controversy and scandal. But that said, ultimately we're gonna have to wait to see. And then let's talk about some 2018 midterm news. And for today's look into the midterms, we go to Montana, where you have Democratic Senator John Tester. And I'm laughing because it's an interesting situation. So John Tester, like I said, he is a senator, he is a Democrat, but he is in a red state. Trump beat Hillary in 2016 by more than 20 points in Montana. And last night, the president headed to Montana for a rally. And how, you ask, did John Tester welcome Donald Trump to Montana? Well, by buying a full page ad in a local newspaper thanking the president. The ad reads, welcome to Montana and thank you President Trump for supporting John's legislation to help veterans and first responders, hold the VA accountable, and get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse in the federal government. Then listing 16 bills Tester was involved with that the president has signed into law. Then stating, Washington's a mess, but that's not stopping John from getting things done for Montana. And that of course brings us to the question, did it work? Did Donald Trump go, hey, you know what? John Tester may be a Democrat, but he's all right by me. Well, uh, well, let's see. You deserve a senator who doesn't just talk like he's from Montana. You deserve a senator who actually votes like he's from Montana. It's time to retire liberal Democrat John Tester. A vote for John Tester is a vote for Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, and the new leader of the Democrat Party, Maxine Waters. Yeah, that went, uh, that went the way that I thought that was gonna go for Tester. Especially because based on other moments, you could tell that Donald Trump was not a fan of John Tester because of what he did with his nominee for VA secretary, Ronnie Jackson. When talking about Jackson, he said this. I put him into the world of politics. How vicious is the world? But John Tester said things about him that were horrible and that weren't true. And Tester's actually the reason I wanted to talk about this story, but there, there were of course other notable moments. One of the other notable moments was when he created this situation where he was he was in the future, talking about this hypothetical of what he would do when he was debating Elizabeth Warren. He also included an interesting Me Too jab during it. I'll let you watch it. I'm gonna get one of those little kits. And in the middle of the debate, when she proclaims that she's of Indian heritage because her mother said she has high cheekbones. <laughs> That's her only evidence, that her mother said she had high cheekbones. We will take that little kit and say, but we have to do it gently. 
Because we're in the Me Too generation, so we have to be very gentle. And after all of that, Elizabeth Warren actually responded on Twitter, right? Hey, at real Donald Trump, while you obsess over my genes, your admin is conducting DNA tests on little kids because you ripped them from their mamas and you are too incompetent to reunite them in time to meet a court order. Maybe you should focus on fixing the lives you're destroying. Which, by the way, if you're not familiar with what she's talking about, there are reports coming out saying the kids and the parents are getting their cheeks swabbed. And for those defending the practice, they say, well, it's not uncommon for children to be trafficked. So you want to verify that they're actually related. And as far as the timeline, it's all supposed to happen really fast. The timeline as set by a federal judge, as of today, officials must make sure every separated parent has a way to contact his or her child. Following that, the next deadline is next Tuesday. By then, separated children under the age of five need to be reunited with their parents. And then finally, by July 26, all of the separated children need to be reunited with their parents. But also, one of the big updates around this part of the story is that the DOJ is now asking for more time. Lawyers informing the court that they may not be able to properly comply with the timeline. So we'll have to wait to see what happens there. And wow, what a journey we have taken on this story. But to take it back where we started, for Tester, th this is going to prove very difficult. Back in 2012, Tester didn't win with a large margin. During the primaries, we saw more Republicans vote, although it is important to note that Tester was unopposed. And his situation, while somewhat unique, is representative of the issue that Democrats have in 2018. There's been so much talk about the blue wave and how many seats the Democrats could get in the House, but in the Senate, it is a big possibility that the Democrats actually lose ground. 35 Senate seats are being voted on this year, and of those, 26 are held by Democrats, with nine of them being held by Republicans. And right now, 10 of the Democrats that are running for re election are running in states that Donald Trump won in 2016. And that includes heavily red states like West Virginia and North Dakota. But all of that said, as far as how things will turn out, I have zero clue. It will be incredibly interesting to see what happens from here. And that's where I'm gonna end today's show. And of course, remember this is the Philip DeFranco Show. It is not just a show, it is a conversation. So whether it's the last story, the first one, anything in between, let me know what you're thinking in those comments down below. Also, while you're at it, if you like this video, you like what I'm trying to do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also, if you missed the last Philip DeFranco Show, you wanna catch up, you can click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you wanna watch a bonus news video we put out, you can click or tap right there. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love Love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow. Ooh, no, Monday. Unless you're watching this on Sunday, in which case I will see you tomorrow.